Hi everyone, my name is Solve and today I'm going to be talking to you about applying practical parameter identifiability analysis to our model of autoimmune myocarditis and in particularly I'd like to highlight why we think this is important and the challenges that we've run into um, with doing this. So to start out, Yes. Uh, with a bit of motivation as to why we're interested in autoimmune myocarditis in the first place. So autoimmune myocarditis or cardiac muscle inflammation is a side effect of a class of cancer treatment uh, known as immune checkpoint inhibitors or ICIs. And about 40% of cancer patients are eligible for treatment with ICIs. In particular here we're interested in nivolumab and ifilimumab. And in about 0.1 to 1% of patients treated with ICIs, autoimmune myocarditis can develop as a side effect. So obviously it's a very rare side effect, uh, but unfortunately it's also very dangerous. So in about 25 to 50% of patients that get autoimmune myocarditis as a side effect, it will prove fatal. Obviously that's something that we would like to avoid. But at the moment, there is no preclinical screening assay available to check for cardiotoxicity of potential new drug compounds. So something like autoimmune myocarditis is only noticed when it starts popping up in patients in clinical trials or thereafter. So what we're really interested in is using mathematical modeling of autoimmune myocarditis to aid in the design of such an in vitro assay. Yes. Yes. Um, so, yeah, what we want to do is build a mathematical model of autoimmune myocarditis, use that to determine the minimal set of essential immune cells that should be in this in vitro cardiotoxicity assay to realistically reproduce what is happening in patients and be able to confidently assess cardiotoxicity of new drug compounds. Um, and ideally what we would then like to set up is a sort of feedback loop between our mathematical model on the one hand, which can inform design of our in vitro setup, and then for data from our in vitro setup to be used to uh, validate our model. So unfortunately, um, when I started my project, no mathematical model of autoimmune myocarditis existed. So we had to start from the biological literature and we really went through and kind of um, derived from there what the essential mechanisms are. So autoimmune myocarditis is a CD4 plus T cell driven disease. So that's the main pathway that um, we focused on. And this diagram on the right kind of summarizes the immunology um, that we got from the biological literature. But because this is the first model of autoimmune myocarditis, we kind of want to keep it as simple as possible so that we have access to as many analytical methods as we can. So obviously this diagram on the right is still far too complicated for that. Um, so what we did is we grouped cell types together if they have a similar immunological function. So for example, oh you can't really see the colors very well, but um, over here on the bottom, which should be green, are our cardiomyocytes, so our heart muscle cells and the cardiac antigens that they release when they're injured. So that's really the stimulant that's going to drive our autoimmune uh, autoimmunity. In blue over here, we have our T cells that have a pro-inflammatory function. In yellow, we have our T cells that have a anti-inflammatory function. And then here in red, we have our innate immune cells, which are both directly uh, activated by the presence of cardiac antigen, but also indirectly downstream of our pathogenic T cells. So simplifying this further by grouping these cells, we get the diagram on the right. So what we're looking at here in the middle is our dead or damaged cardiomyocytes, which release cardiac antigen and thus stimulate autoimmunity. We have our pathogenic T cells P and our innate immune cells I, which are activated either directly by the release of this antigen or uh, our pathogenic T cells can activate our innate immune cells as well. Uh, and both of these cell types then can cause further damage to the myocardium. And we have our T regulatory cells, which uh, provide kind of the brakes on the immune system. So they inhibit the autoimmune cycle that exists over here. So as I said, the two immune checkpoint inhibitors that we're most interested in are nivolumab and ipilimumab. And essentially what they do is kind of release the brakes from the immune system 
So with the interactions that they have here with these various immunological processes, they really stimulate the immune response. Um, so this diagram we translated into a set of ODEs, and as I said, we want to try and keep this as simple and as minimal as possible, but we still end up with four ODEs and 13 parameters. Um, and this is as much as we could reduce it, but still capture the behavior that we think we should see. And I'll try and explain to you what that is. So what we're looking at here is time traces of two of our variables. So our damaged cardiomyocytes and our pathogenic T cells. And what we're doing here is at time zero in our initial conditions, we're perturbing the immune system by adding uh, a certain number of pathogenic T cells to kick off autoimmunity. And what we're really showing here is that if we have a low number of these pathogenic T cells, so 100 or 250 in this case, um, we actually see that although they start non-zero here, they kind of approach the origin again and we don't actually see inflammation in this case. However, if we have a higher number of pathogenic T cells initially, we do see autoimmunity develop. We approach this higher steady state here, which we call our disease steady state, and we do get autoimmunity, so we do have myocarditis developing. So really what I want to show here is that in this model, in the ICI-free conditions that we have here, so no drugs involved, we have three non-negative steady states. We have a healthy origin where there is no inflammation, no cardiac damage. We have our disease steady states where myocarditis has developed. And in between, although not shown here, is a saddle point which separates their basins of attraction. And what this saddle point really represents is kind of an immune threshold. And if you cross that threshold, then autoimmunity is triggered and we're going to approach this higher steady state. If you don't meet that threshold, then you're going to go back to the origin and the disease will not develop. So this is, as I said, in ICI-free conditions, obviously what we're interested in most is what happens if we're going to add ICIs. So I'm going to show you quickly here what happens if we're adding the volumap. This is qualitatively similar to what happens if we're adding a polymimap. So over here on the left, we're looking at how many non-negative steady states does our system have um, in this parameter space, which are the two parameters that are affected by the presence of nivolumab. So this red star indicates our ICI-free conditions, and we can see that we're in this nice space here where we have our three non-negative steady states, so healthy, disease, and immune threshold. And if we're going to add nivolumab, then we're going to move roughly in the direction of this dashed line um, away from the ICI-free state. Now, for a while, we'll still be in this space where we have three non-negative steady states, but eventually we're going to cross into uh, a part of parameter space where we only have two non-negative steady states. Um, to explore further what happens as we're doing this, we have the bifurcation diagram over here, where in red we have stable steady states, so our healthy one and our diseased one, and in between we have that saddle point, that immune threshold. The dashed line indicates our ICI-free conditions, and as we're adding the volumap, we're going to move away to the right. And what we can see really happens is that our saddle point or our immune threshold is going to come down. It's going to approach our healthy steady state at the origin, and eventually we'll have a transcritical bifurcation, where actually uh, we then are in this space where we only have two non-negative steady states, and our origin is unstable. Um, so biologically, what is happening here is that if we're going to add a volumap to the system, that threshold for autoimmunity is coming down, so your risk of developing myocarditis is going to increase. Um, and we are very happy to see that because that um, goes well with the fact that patients who are being treated with ICIs are at higher risk of developing autoimmune myocarditis than the general public. So to summarize so far, what we've done is we've constructed and characterized the first mathematical model of autoimmune myocarditis. Um, and we have shown that it behaves as we would expect based on biological literature. Uh, if we want to take this model further, there's a couple of things that we can do. So as I said, we want it to match it with this in vitro setup and create that feedback loop between the two. 
Uh, and another thing that we've been working on is using optimal control theory to optimize treatment schedules of immune checkpoint inhibitors to design treatment schedules for nivolumab and ipilimumab where we can apply the same number of doses but not get autoimmune myocarditis as a side effect. In both of those cases, we need to make sure that we can confidently estimate our model parameters. So obviously in the top case with the in vitro setup, we need to make sure that the data we're getting from our in vitro setup is sufficient to uh, estimate model parameters. And in the case of working with treatment schedules, if we want to take that anywhere near the clinic, we need to make sure that we can confidently say that the parameter values that we're getting are biologically relevant. So, to be able to do that, we need to assess whether or not our model is practically identifiable. So that's what the rest of my talk is going to be about. So, to take a step back, there's two types of parameter identifiability, which you probably all know. So, to start with, structural identifiability really asks the question, does every parameter set give rise to a unique distribution of model outputs? And this is just a property of your model. Um, it assumes that if you, basically, if you have perfectly noise-free time continuous data, can you confidently estimate your model parameters? Uh, and this is really a prerequisite for practical identifiability. If you don't have this, your model is never going to be practically identifiable. If your model is structurally identifiable, then we can think about practical identifiability, which asks the question, can parameter values be confidently estimated for a given data set? So now this becomes a property of your model and the available data that you have. Um, and one thing that you can do with this is that you can do this sort of analysis before you have data to really inform what the nature is of the data that you require in order to confidently estimate uh, the values of your model parameters. So to apply this to our model, solve structural identifiability, we use two different methods. So we use DAISY, which is a software tool, and we use a simple scaling method that was introduced by Castro and de Boer. Um, and there's obviously lots of other options here, like Cyan or GenSSI or loads of other tools that are out there. Uh, but for us, the important thing is that our model parameters are only structurally identifiable if we observe all four variables. So one thing that tells us is that we can look into practical identifiability because we do have structural identifiability, but also this gives us the first requirement on our data sets in that we have to observe all four variables. So for practical identifiability, uh, we chose to use maximum likelihood profiling and that is purely for computational feasibility. We have 30 model parameters, so anything like MCMC is going to be way too computationally expensive to do. Um, so what we require for maximum likelihood profiling is a set or subset of our model parameters for which we want to determine whether or not they are practically identifiable. Uh, we need a synthetic data set consisting of a number of measurements at a certain level of noise. Uh, and we need the log likelihood function that we're going to maximize. So how does this actually work? For a given set of parameters of interest, P, so that's the parameter that we're going to profile, um, for each parameter, PI, in that set, you're going to set a range of values over which you are going to profile this parameter. And then for each uh, value, in that range for each parameter, you're going to set your parameter equal to that value and you're going to optimize the values of all the other parameters in P such that your log likelihood is maximized. Um, and then the last thing you need to do is you need to plot this parameter PI against the maximum likelihood that you have uh, computed to create your profile. So what might these profiles look like? These are uh, some hypothetical examples. So if, as here on the left, your profile is completely flat, that means your uh, parameter is practically unidentifiable. If it is as nicely, sharply peaked as here on the right, that means that it is identifiable and you can confidently estimate the value of this parameter given the data set that you have provided. If you can also get something that looks more like here in the middle where we have this plateau where you can't necessarily estimate your parameter value but you can set limits um, on where that value might be. Okay, so as I said, what we want to use practical identifiability for is to determine 
what kind of data we're going to need in terms of levels of noise and number of measurements to uh, confidently estimate the parameters in our model. Um, so what we've done to create our synthetic data set, we don't have access to actual data at the moment, unfortunately. So we've created synthetic data where we kind of concentrate our measurements on the earlier time points of our time traces because we do have these kind of earlier faster dynamics um, and we want to make sure that we capture that. Um, then we add 5% Gaussian noise to each of these data points uh, to create the data set that you see in red from the actual solutions in blue. Um, and then because our um, model, default model parameters are quite rough estimates. We profile over quite a wide range, so between like 10% of our default value to five times the default value. Um, and when we're optimizing, the parameters that we're optimizing can take on any value at all. And then we use global search in MATLAB to find hopefully the global maximum of our log likelihood. So. Um, 30 model parameters, unfortunately, is not doable. So we have to take a subset of our model parameters to profile. And this is what that might look like. So this is a subset that contains our four um, death or deactivation parameters from the model. And this parameter phi, which is a fraction. So that one is actually quite limited in the values that it can take on, only between 0 and 1. And here we see an example of a subset for which this works very nicely. Nicely sharp peaks. You can see in the zoomed in insets that actually our confidence intervals, which are between the red and the yellow, are very narrow. The green indicates where our true value is that the synthetic data was generated from. And the purple indicates uh, where our log likelihood is maximized. If like here we can't actually see the confidence interval, that's because the, even though I've zoomed in, the red and the yellow line are still underneath the purple. So this is a set where this works very well. Um, this isn't always the case. So if I take a different subset, this is our four activation rates, then we get a completely different picture where parameter A2, which is activation of, um, or sorry, damage to cardiomyocytes from innate immune cells, completely unidentifiable. Um, A1 looks a bit better. And for these two, we kind of get that plateau result that I showed earlier, where we can kind of set an upper limit for our parameter value, but we're not going to confidently estimate the actual value of the model parameter. So the two subsets I've shown so far have been grouped based on immunological function that these parameters represent. That's not the only way you can group it. So another option is to group by ODE. Um, so here I've taken a1, A2, these two activation rates, and D1, which is our clearance rate, um, and you get this, totally practically unidentifiable. And that kind of makes sense if you think about the steps that we're taking, because if you set one of these three parameters and you're going to optimize the other two, then those values can always compensate for each other. So this is never going to be practically identifiable. Um, okay, so that's some of the results that we've gotten. So just to summarize, we've developed the first mathematical model of autoimmune myocarditis, and this is the minimal model that we can make that still captures the behavior that we need it to, to show. And we've done that by characterizing steady state behavior to show that it, it has the steady states that we need it to have and that those steady states behave, behave as they should when we're adding drugs to the model. And if we want to take this further, um, by working with an in vitro setup or the clinics or anywhere where we're going to get data, we need to make sure that we can run a practical identifiability analysis on this model, um, ideally with the full set of parameters. And at the moment, that's just not possible. It's too computationally expensive. Um, so really what we need for us, for us is improvements to numerical methods of optimization. Um, to really allow a complete identifiability analysis because the optimization step of this algorithm is really where the bottleneck is for us. It's optimizing in a high dimensional parameter space that's proving a big challenge and it's finding the global maximum of the log likelihood that's also forming a really big challenge at the moment that we're, we've been unable to solve so far. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank my supervisors, Ruth and Sarah, from the MI and Ken and the Millet Rush, and I'm very happy to take any questions and feedback and ideas 
asked her what to do with this. Thank you. Thank you, Solveig. Have we, do we have questions from the audience? Oh. Um. Hi, very nice talk, thank you. Um, I was wondering, in terms of the data, the, the choice of the data points uh, in terms of the number of days, uh, you said you chose it such that you can characterize the curve, but do you have a, is there a more concrete way to choose those points, you think? Or you just sort of just choose them based on the heuristic? Or? I mean, we definitely chose them because we know what these curves look like, right? Um, I think it's hard to say, if, I think, if there is a better way because um, at the moment, this is all we have to work with. Um, so right now, these data points, especially in the beginning, is so this is time in days, right? And these first ones are like day one, two, three. So they're not, I wouldn't say like we're not trying to measure every three minutes. So in that sense, it's, um, I think, realistic enough. But I'm sure there are smarter ways to do this than how I've done it now, which is look at this graph and be like, yeah, we should probably have a more dense measurement in this early stage. But earlier in in the earlier slides, you showed different time traces. But does that mean that it depends on different uh, time traces, which is depending on the parameters you chose, you would choose the time the collection differently? So um, it would depend on the initial conditions. So the initial conditions that we've chosen here um, are ones for which we do develop myocarditis, and we see this early behavior. If we were to choose initial conditions that didn't lead to myocarditis, then this probably wouldn't be necessary because those curves are much flatter. So you could have a much more uniform distribution in time. Um, so yeah, it depends highly on the initial conditions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And the second question is, uh, could you show the slides where you show the um, posterior again? Was it was it a posterior that you showed? Uh, the profiles. The profile, like yeah. yeah. Sorry, I don't know which one you want. <laughs> Um, that in the case to the second case when you didn't go so well, yeah. so uh, what is the implication of those? Does that does it even matter if you didn't get, a, you couldn't estimate it well, in, um, in, from a clinical point of view? So I think this definitely, um, because, I mean, what this tells us is that if we want to estimate this model parameter, then either we need to also already know some of these. I haven't tried that specifically. Or we need kind of better data in the sense that we need either less noise or more data points, probably. But I would personally want to know all the mo the um, parameter values in my model. Does that Yes, but that? also, like, like you said, if you couldn't estimate one of the parameter well, it's because the other ones will compensate. But does that mean, like, so, which means that uh, I just want to ask, does it even matter whether you can estimate the parameters as well in terms of the, the outcomes you're trying to predict, which is the cell count? Oh, okay, I think I see what you're saying. Um, I still want to say yes, because I think that because the way we've milled the model here, these uh, model parameters all represent very specific immunological uh, interactions, right? So I would assume that although there might be a pop like a, a distribution in the population, I would be very surprised if that uh, distribution is multimodal. So I think that within some uncertainty, there is probably a biologically realistic value of each of these parameters, and I would like to know what it is. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Alva. Really good talk. Um, I had a question about the optimization step, actually. And I was wondering, do you know if there are any um, optimization routines which are meant for um, doing profile likelihood optimization? So, in the sense of, in the previous step of an optimization for a profile likelihood calculation, for example, you might have things like the covariance matrix in your proposals in terms of how the, how the next proposal step in your optimization is, is used. Are there any like 
optimization routines which are used bespoke for profile likelihood calculation that you know of? Not that I know of. Okay. No. We basically went through the optimization toolbox in MATLAB and used about everything in there before we found something <laughs> that worked. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? So at, at the start, you said that there's a, um, it's about a rate of 1% for patients exhibiting that. Have, have you tried to kind of optimize it to find a set of parameters that give you that observed rate of myocarditis or whatever it's called? Or? Uh, we haven't really done like a population level analysis with this at all, no. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, thank you for well, thank you for the good talk. Um, I'm just curious. I think you had one slide where you where you said that the treatment mostly affects one parameter in term or one parameter controls whether on where you are in the phase space, uh, not in the phase space. How many how many uh, stable fixed points uh, you have? Is that right, or was it more than one parameter uh, that so controls it? Two of them for each type of ICI that we're looking at. Okay. Yeah. And did you find that those parameters were practically identifiable from the data that you have or that you might have? Um, so it highly depends. So this parameter is a death or uh, like kind of a deactivation rate. So in that first subset that I showed, this one is included and it was practically identifiable. This one uh, is an activation rate, so that is one of the ones that showed a plateau, so we can kind of set an upper limit, but not much more than that. Um, the fact that that is the case here is also highly dependent on the subset of parameters that I've chosen. Uh, so I can't really say at the moment anything about any other conditions that we could do this under. Yeah, I was just curious whether maybe you can tolerate uncertainty in some parameters as long as you can predict uh, how these uh, fixed points evolve. But uh, it doesn't seem like that's the case. No, and I think um, one of the reasons that that might not be as big a reason is that the conditions that, the initial conditions that we use in our practical identifiability analysis are ones that cause autoimmune myocarditis in an ICI free condition as well. So how much that threshold moves doesn't really affect the output that we get as much. Hi, so big. Um, thanks for the talk. For the talk, um, I was just I had two thoughts about your um, finding a profile likelihood at the end. There, I wondered if you tried either already. Um, the first, since it's a profile likelihood you're after, I'm wondering if it's possible to do something relatively cheap at that point to, to like a local sensitivity analysis to see if there's any dimensions that you think aren't going to impact at all, so that you can reduce your parameter space and then see what you get like that or would that be totally unhelpful um so i'm afraid so in this case because we've done a global sensitivity analysis and um for us uh, setting the initial parameter values was a big challenge because we don't have any data to go on but because we built the model based on what the biological literature tells us are important mechanisms we picked the parameter set such that our model outputs are sensitive to all our parameter values so in that case, um, it, running a sensitivity analysis won't tell us that any of the directions are not important. Um, and the second thing is, would something like emulation, like we heard about earlier today, help? Or is it that the dimensionality is a problem regardless of how quick you make your model? It might be. Um, I, this was the first time I was hearing about emulation, so I would need to <laughs> yeah, need a bit more time to look into that. Um, but yeah, a good session. There was another question in the front. Yeah, thank you for your talk. I was wondering, um, this detail was not captured, but in trying to come up with a profile likelihood, you were talking about how like optimization is expensive. And I wondered if you had considered 
for generating the profile likelihood, say at iteration one, if you have a particular point, so you fix one parameter value and optimize the others. Mm -hmm. um, as you move along that curve, did you consider having the starting points as the optimal values for the previous iteration? Yeah, so we actually do that okay. already. Yeah, yeah because thanks. that helps it. Like yeah, 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 definitely, okay. yeah, thanks. Okay, any other questions? Then we will uh, put a stop for the session now. Thank you so big again. Thanks.